Hi, Nikita. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm okay. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. Everyone should rate and review us. Um, you're Nikita Petrov. You're in Russia. Mm. And as if to drive home the point that you're Russian, you're, you're smoking a cigarette. Correct. Thank you for the atmospherics. <laughs> um, you, first of all, I should say that you work with me at the Non-Zero Foundation which puts out Blogging Heads TV, Meaning of Life TV, Non-Zero Newsletter, and so on. Um, but that's not really the reason I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you because we're taping this the day before uh, Joe Biden uh, has a, a summit with uh, Vladimir Putin. Mm. And uh, I just wanted to talk about Russia and, and give people a sense for how the world might look from the point of view of a Russian. And you would fit the description of a Russian. I claim so. Is that yes. correct? Yeah, that's my stance. Okay. Why don't we start? And and, and I should say, I, I, I think this would be a value, even if people see or hear it um, after, uh, after the summit. Uh, because I don't think, we in America very often get a sense for how things look from kind of the street, so to speak, in Russia. Um, and of course, you don't claim to speak for the average Russian. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, yeah, I always you, run you know, into these problems. I, I dread some of the questions you're going to ask because I remember like last time we talked about Russia some years ago. You would ask, like, so do people really support Putin? And where do you start answering that question? What does support Putin mean uh, when you're not able to, like, vote him out or anything? Uh, where do you, how do you base your view of what people think on what? On polls? That would be strange. On your conversation with a taxi driver? That's very anecdotal. And so it's how the things look from the street is not always clear when you're even standing in the same in the street <laughs> you're speaking of uh -huh. but let's try yeah well i mean we could have a conversation about the nature of truth hmm? uh i i say i said you know it sounds like we're, we're heading for some pretty deep territory here but uh before we get there maybe a thing to do by way of conveying both your 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 limitations as a as some kind of spokesperson uh for russia and and by by way of illuminating um just your perspective like where do you see yourself in what what part of russian culture society whatever do you see yourself as occupying like what is your demographic i mean for starters Age-wise, you are what we in America would call a millennial, right? I think so, 32. Okay. Um, and I think of you, correct me if I'm wrong, as kind of a member of the counterculture. Do you know what I mean by that? It, yeah, I do. Um, I don't know. I... I, I, I kind of feel as a, a bit of a, you know, my work is with Americans, so I'm not tied to, let's say, you know, like the, the pandemic hits and people are uh, losing jobs or something that does not concern me individually uh, in terms of my occupation and that's a big so economically you're not dependent on the russian economy you personally i mean i am dependent because uh, if there's not food in the stores then i can't buy that food uh and there has been there haven't been like actual shortages of food but the kinds of food that you find in the stores has been uh you know the the, the variety has been uh, getting smaller because of the sanctions like you can't buy good cheese anymore um, because of then, uh, American-led sanctions. Right. Well, I forget whether America played the main role or it's, uh, you know, the, the West, West Western sanctions. Yeah, yeah. Cheese is a problem. And this is <laughs> these are in response to 
the Crimea in particular, the the uh I think that I think so. I think this was after Crimea. It's it's some years that this has been the case that like So that's having when, an actual impact that that Russians are aware of. Like they go to the supermarket and there's not as much and there's not all the food they would like to see and they think, well, this is America and the West. Right. And that's the argument against these kinds of sanctions. Like I guess the logic behind imposing such sanctions is you want to punish the government that's doing some evil things in your perspective. But I'm not sure if the government is really suffering. I think Putin can have all the cheese that he wants. Uh, but <laughs> I suspect. I suspect. <laughs> but the I mean, if worse came people... to worse, he could, he could sell that mansion that Navalny uh, <laughs> yeah. revealed. <laughs> um, and uh, to, to scrounge up some cash. Um, so, so, but my okay, point is so like, anyway, I'm not, I'm, uh, you know, the, the particulars of, you know, the domestic situation are not affecting me as much as many others. But then on the other hand, right now we're in this, I mean, you could start with like the poison of Navalny as one of the latest turning points. And then his return to Russia, and then his jail sentence. And after that, there have been... that There's new legislature, there's uh, uh, new ways to use the legislature, which leads to... Um, there are media organizations and individuals, like if you're a journalist, and in the, in the vaguest of definitions, you know, you have a Telegram channel or whatever, you can be labeled as a foreign agent now. And they've started doing this pretty uh, aggressively lately. And that, you know, destroys uh, your business model if you, like, de depend on advertisers. Let's say advertisers don't want to be on the platform that on every page has this huge uh, disclaimer. This material has been written by a foreign agent. Um, and so things Wait, like let that me, are let's, starting let's to... Let me... Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's drill down on that and 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 get clear on that situation. For starters, by way of further situating you, you have. Uh, I mean, I in in Russia do do I, I assume like one question about people is do you like Navalny or not like him? Right, there are people who support Navalny, people who don't support him. I think you in the past have been supportive of him. And uh, one question is, is that getting harder and harder to do? That you're suggesting that it's getting harder and harder to continue to express support for him. What? Continue to donate to his cause with, or what? With Navalny specifically, they just uh, labeled his organization extremist, which is like a step extremist, away from terrorist. Okay. Uh, and if you give money to them, I think you're facing jail time. Uh, and then if you like my particular situation, I have donated money before I stopped once they decided that these are extremists and I've been to public protests organized by that organization, which makes me a supporter of that organization. So I'm supporting extremists. Uh, and that, I think, if I if I read this correctly, right now, uh, like this is since a couple of weeks ago, I guess, I am not able to run for any kind of office in Russia. And then uh -oh. there are these. There goes that career ambition. <laughs> yeah, and so and then there are these gradations, right? So I was at the protest. I donated money in the past. If I were to donate money now to continue donating, uh, then I think that's potentially jail time. So you're saying you already are ineligible for running for office because of your past behavior? If I read this correctly, so, yeah, and this is one of the so one of the reasons this particular law, even like people in the state Duma in the parliament, some of them were uh unhappy with it because I don't know the English the correct English legal term, but the law is not supposed to be Applied to things that happened before the law was passed, right? 
Um, right. In this case, they're saying it does apply. Okay. I think there's like a one year uh, limit or something. And, and so has it gotten to the point where you're even in venues like this? Like right now, as we talk, you feel constrained in what you can say, or do you? Can you rest assured that uh, my podcast does not have a wide following in the Kremlin? I don't think or I can what? rest assured, but this is this is where personal choice uh, comes into play. Like, when do you decide to allow your fear to start guiding your actions? Like last time we talked about Russia, I think you asked me a similar question. I said I don't think I should be worried about that because this is in English. We don't have a you know million viewers. Uh, I'm definitely less, uh, you know, I feel less safe now. But my rationale, the, the way I'm uh, calming myself down, uh, is that this is in English. This is, I'm not, I definitely wouldn't do anything right now, like journalistic, uh, in talking about politics in Russian online. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. Um, but in English, I'm hoping uh, that, uh, it's also here's the thing it's not just i mean this is i i don't have uh like a good analysis of it but a, a, a thing that i've been thinking about is how do these things work when there is a law that allows to um you know put somebody in jail or do some kind of damage to a person like recently they put i think they give him a couple of months or something uh, to this blogger who's not, he's not a political actor. He's a, a freaky YouTube personality. Um, but they found, uh, like satire, satirical song that he did, probably drunk some time ago about, um, there was this huge thing, uh, uh, somewhere like in, in, in the beginning of Putin's, uh, tenure when, um, a uh, theater was captured by and kept hostage by uh, terrorists and um, people died and, and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so he did a song mm -hmm. about that. And so now he's in jail. Um, this is, I don't think that we don't know exactly what happened with that guy. Like what led to, to the authorities to focus on that person to, uh, for, for the police to come and search his apartment and everything. But the tool is there, right? So, I've seen some versions of what happened with him, and one version is he's a blogger who's who has blogger uh, people who don't like him, and there's just a beef between two guys who are not political. Who you know, it doesn't. It's not really a part of this. Later, they're not uh, opposing Putin or anything, but he had a problem with somebody else. That somebody else decided, I'm just gonna write. A letter saying you are supporting terrorists and then hmm. you know that leads to consequences so it's like it's not necessarily that every problem of that sort that uh happens happens because like the state decided to go against the bloggers who sing songs uh but the tool right. is there now that there is this yeah well it's almost worse than this it's almost worse than the repression having to originate with the state because it mm -hmm. means like everyone who, you know, everyone is potentially monitoring you. Someone yeah. who decides they don't like you can report yeah. you to the state. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's this um, phrase, uh, by, a, a Soviet writer who later immigrated to the U.S., Davlatov, uh, where he says, we keep, um, we keep criticizing and for good reasons, Comrade Stalin, but, I still want to ask the question, who wrote those 4 million reports, you know, on fellow citizens that led to arrests, mm -hmm. right? It's not Stalin mm -hmm. personally going after everybody who ends up in the gulag. There's a neighbor, you know, you're sharing a, a communal flat with somebody, you have a problem, and then they report to the KGB that you've been telling uh, political jokes in the kitchen, and then you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. We're not yet at that stage, but the dynamic uh, is, is moving there. So over what period of time have things gotten noticeably tighter in this regard? And do you have 
an understanding of what caused it? I mean, I don't know when we had our last conversation, maybe three years ago or two yeah. years ago or something, but. I mean, they've been getting they've been getting worse. I think even in that conversation, I quoted this joke that I saw. I think on Reddit, where uh, somebody asked to describe the history of your country in one sentence, and somebody for Russia proposed, and then thing got worse. Uh, just <laughs> whatever period of time you take, you can sort of apply it. They've been getting, uh, you know, politically in terms of political freedoms and and whatnot worse since Putin came to power, but the most recent lag, uh, I think I would tie it to the pandemic and the return of Navalny. Uh, and and then there's the Belarusian situation where in Belarus, they had elections. It so mm -hmm. happened that by the time the elections actually took place, all of the oppositional candidates were removed from the election. And the only candidate that stayed uh, or rather appeared at the kind of tail end of it is a wife of one of these oppositional candidates. And so she became the unifying figure. Right. And then huge unprecedented protests started happening in Belarus. And I remember as this was happening, I felt... Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't really see how do you just stay in power when it looks like the entire country is pretty clearly telling you, we don't want you. And then in the Belarus situation, it turns out it's actually not very difficult to stay in power if you have the army and the police on your side. And that's the case in Belarus. And so Lukashenko is there, and I think it's a little bit of a you know, the Russian government is looking around, they see what's happening in Belarus, they see what uh, is working in Kazakhstan, and they're kind of seeing, you know, taking lessons from that. And I think with Belarus, with Navalny, you know, he's poisoned, he's in a coma, he goes uh, to Germany to get battery, and then he comes back to Russia immediately at the airport, he's detained, and then he's arrested, and now he's in jail. Um, and upon his return, I forget the timeline, I, 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 maybe right before his return, they published this investigation of who poisoned Navalny with names and pictures. Here's a team of people who do this kind of thing. Here's how we tracked why we think these are the, uh, these people. Navalny, even there's the, this bizarre video on YouTube that it's gotten, I think, tens of millions of uh, views where he's calling one of the people involved in the operation, a person who's responsible for cleaning the traces of the poison from Navalny's underwear, from his, uh, mm. uh, you know, where they put the poison. And he just pretends to be some higher up and says, let's do a debrief, like what, what went wrong? Why did the mm -hmm. operation fail? And they talk for like half an hour and the guy's yeah. giving him his opinion and everything. So now that with, was mind blowing. I mean, can I ask you a question? Like, why didn't the guy, Navalny, wasn't Navalny talking the way he normally talks or did he do a fake accent or something? I mean, I can't believe bizarre. the guy didn't go, wait a second, you sound like Navalny. Maybe I shouldn't divulge. Everything yeah. I did in our attempt to kill you, because you could be recording this if you're Navalny. I mean, was he? He I wasn't using an accent, was he? He was. He was speaking like Navalny, and Navalny does he have a <laughs> you know a way of speaking like it's a recognizable speech pattern. He, 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 you know, uh, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, as I was watching that video, I was. Even though I have no reason to distrust Navalny, it's just too bizarre to just take it like this is really happening. The person, but you know, in in talking with people like other Russians, just what do you think about that? It, that again, that has been for for many people that was a stumbling block. Like, wait, you're saying they're they're at which level of stupid? <laughs> um, but <laughs> but I think it's like it's early in the morning. Uh, a phone call 
uh, <laughs> woke this guy up. The number that he used is a number that uh, apparently it's like an intercom number that they use for these kind of. Oh, he would recognize circuit. the number and immediately trust the caller. Right. It's it's an, and, and the conversation starts with like he knows that there's a problem. Right. This is yeah. uh, in the news and uh, there, there's probably already pre- some kind of pressure, you know, at work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's early in the morning. You get a call and the voice on the other line says, all right, you fucked up. Uh, <laughs> tell me what went wrong. <laughs> and so you're in a defensive situation. You didn't expect it. And so you start mumbling things. So do, do I assume... Again, I think people get a sense for what, where you sit in things. You're, you're kind of young, urban. You grew up in Moscow, but, uh, or around Moscow, but live in St. Petersburg. You're, you're artistically inclined. You're, you know, I think people get a sense for who, what your crowd would be. And I assume that in your crowd, everyone is assuming that, yes, uh, Putin had Navalny poisoned, although I don't know uh, for sure. But do you have a sense for how widespread that view is um, in Russia? Like, uh, is it just commonly thought? I guess in a way, the question is, do you think the average Putin supporter and Navalny opponent would say, well, yeah, we poisoned him, but he deserved it or... No, we would never poison him. Or do you, do you have any sense for the lay of a the landscape of opinion on this question? So, in terms of my circle, I don't think that everybody would say that Putin poisoned Navalny. Um, and but there is not a good alternative story. So it's not when you when you are in that argument. Obviously, Putin has poisoned Navalny. No, he definitely didn't. The one side leans on these investigations, like here's how the system works. Uh, here's the proof of that. The other side tends to say things like, um, if they really wanted to poison him, that's actually what Putin said. Listen, if we wanted to kill him, he would be dead, right? Uh, what is this, uh, you weird, would think. what is this weird, you know, military grade poison that keeps not killing people? It's these kinds of arguments. So it's <laughs> so it's not uh, uh, an alternative theory as to what exactly happened with Navalny. It's uh, some argument for why the allegation is absurd. And then uh, there could be they would throw in a bunch of different theories, like maybe things that have been mentioned after he was poisoned, uh, range from. He had too much vodka to he was on a diet that uh, made it hard on his heart or something to he was poisoned by his own people to make this, uh, you know, uh, point of tension so that then we can blame the Russian government Mm -hmm. to uh, either the German or the American uh, secret services poisoned him. It's just like this array of things that you what you don't put all of your chips into one of them. You're saying maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Obviously, it's not Putin because then he would be dead, uh, or it's against Putin's interest or something like that. Uh, and and that's, uh, is there that kind of position is is, yeah. is is not uncommon. Uh, I can't give you the like the breakdown. How many people believe that? How many people believe that? Um, but it's not uncommon. But I don't think, and this is me getting into these, like the nature of truth and stuff. Like when people argue these things, it's not always what they believe to be true. It's a position you take in a conflict. You side with one side or the other, and then, you know, you may just keep being on that side, no matter what the situation is, you just find a way to support uh, the side you're in, the position you're in, and we are increasingly the... familiar with that dynamic in America. Believe right. me, right. Um, the uh, so, and I assume, um, 
Well, I was going to say, is there roughly the same kind of landscape of opinion with respect to, I think it's called the, the Scripnol poisonings, the two people who were killed in England, uh, and, and, uh, but I'm also interested in the question of like, in, is there genuine cause for uncertainty, at least, uh, in the sense that sometimes initiatives like this could be taken by like oligarchs or something, right? Like they might have somebody killed. I mean, my assumption would be that the way Russia works, no oligarch is going to take the initiative to kill Navalny without getting clearance from the Kremlin. I, I, I just have to think. Uh, right. I think in this particular case, it's hard to imagine that this is just a rogue person doing this. Also, yeah. if you are to trust the investigation that it's like Navalny did a part of it, Navalny's own, own team did part of it, but most of it was done by uh, other for, by journalists. And mm -hmm. uh, what they show, I actually, they, they just released a couple of days ago a new video giving more detail to uh, how they think the system works and alleging that it's not just Navalny, like this particular team of people, this particular structure uh, acted not only with Navalny, but they have these other people, including people who, like, there's this journalist, Dmitry Bukov, uh, writer and journalist, who... Now, wait, who released this video? You said they. Who? who? This is N Navalny's, Navalny's team. Uh, I just haven't okay. seen the video, but they just released this, you know, another expose of this uh, whole situation a couple of days ago. Okay. One of the people that they're talking about there is this writer who, like, had an episode. He spent some time in a... I don't know if you call it a coma or what, but like some days he was, uh, you know, in a hospital unconscious. And with him, there was at the time, like some people said, maybe he was poisoned. And then neither himself nor the public really, you know, even tried to uh, entertain that theory very seriously. It's like, whatever, he, you know, something with his health. And now these people, the Navalny people are saying, supposedly some, again, I haven't seen the video yet, with some proof that it's the same team. They, The kinds of proof that they have is, you know, they isolated the people on the team. They uh, show that, like, these people are responsible for actually poisoning. These people are the cleanup team, etc. And then they track travel of a person, like he went from Moscow to Krasnodar on such and such date, and then from Krasnodar to here on, on a different date. And look, these two guys are always in the same city with him, and they arrive a day before or on the same day, day as he does. This kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and so now, you know, they're saying that uh, Bikov was poisoned, and he is kind of like, I suppose now it's been some years since his uh you know episode happened and, and But that would and be another case where it wasn't fatal. Yeah, there's well they say the argument that's used as a response to the argument why don't they die is it's a question of dosage. The what the reason you want to use that way of killing people is because if it works as planned, then it's just something that happened with a person's uh, health and there's no trace, no proof, no, you know, uh, there's not a a gun, uh, there's not, a, a, you know, a, a violent death that occurred in the street. Um, and so you want to get the dosage right. If you do it, put too much, then other people might uh get poisoned that the poison was wasn't planned for them and you don't want that because that brings attention so you just want to mm -hmm. get it just right and if you do give a little too little then you have what this guy back of had you have a few days in a in a coma type situation and you're back on your feet so i would i would assume that you know if there has been uh, you, you know, an increase in constraint on expression of opinion and, and, and so on. If there has been just, it just sounds like kind of year after year, some degree of tightening. Um, for sure, for sure. And again, that lately, there is more, 
Yeah. Uh, lately, in the last, I, I would assume there's more of a, a sense of threat. I mean, you can't, you know, step into Putin's shoes, but mm -hmm. I would assume. I, I mean, you know, we have seen Navalny, the way he uses new media, YouTube especially, right? right to bring tons of unwelcome attention on various aspects of uh, not just the Russian government, but oligarchs. Um, and so, uh, you know, it seems like one thing that may be going on is that, uh, you know, the, the, the supposed tendency of the Internet to kind of decentralize power and enable actors to challenge authorities to some extent that's real i mean navalny has shown that you oh, can sure, yeah. in principle harness these things to threaten power structures it's just that there are also ways of responding to that threat right i mean to what extent do you see you know the 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 the, the kind of growing crackdown as an attempt to adapt to this new to, to threats posed by the internet I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's it's a case by case situation. I, th I mean, like the the regime is responding to particular challenges. Uh, you know, the internet was pretty free until they decided this is a problem that is so free. This Navalny guy or some other person is gaining traction, or uh, you know, there's a news website that is not under the government control. And uh, they're posting news that the government doesn't want to post. For a while, that just is the case. And then they decide to pass this law about foreign agents. If you get any kind of funding from abroad and you do any kind of journalism or activism here, uh, you're a foreign la agent and you need to label yourself as such. And everything that you post should come with a disclaimer. This is by a foreign agent. And that's a way to you know, destroy or diminish uh, the uh, success of these independent media organizations. So you, to me, it looks like they're responding to situations when, when they see, okay, this is, you know, something is becoming too much of a threat, too much of an issue. Let's figure out a way to deal with this one. And then the trend is, yeah, more regulation, uh, of the internet, of any kind of media, and like with Navalny specifically, they passed this law and and decided, uh, you know, against extremism. That seems to be just designed specifically to deal with this one guy and his organization. Mm -hmm. When we last talked, and when I keep saying when we last talked, I don't mean when you and I last talked, we, we talk every week, but when uh, we last recorded a conversation, I remember you saying, well, yeah, the internet, uh, you know, is a little unruly probably from the government's point of view, but a, but a pretty large percentage of the population is still getting its, its information from old media. They're watching TV, they're reading, you know, I guess government approved periodicals or something. Um, TV. It's TV. And I thought, well, that's bound to change with time as more and more people get internet access and so on. Uh, do you, is that one thing that seems to be going on? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a slow process. There's still, you know, if you live in a village where there is no good reception, TV is still there. There's also a mixture. Like, I mean, TV is a different kind of medium than internet. You don't, like on, let's say my mother she uses the internet. Uh, she's not a Putin supporter, but there are like three TV sets in that apartment and like two of them are usually on. And so you still have this background of either the government's position or some talk show where it's supposed to be a debate, but it's like a yelling match between uh, like the propagandist and then their, uh, sort of talking liberal or something. And it's, it, it still creates the ambience, the mood, uh, of just 
anger and frustration and we are in a circle of enemies and you know so uh, there are people who use the internet but they don't seek out Navalny's videos right they look at the cats and the recipes and then TV is sort of in the background uh, but it still accomplishes something in terms of influencing your psychology your uh, kind of mood about the and situation. it is still state controlled tv tv is still state controlled the internet is starting to get <laughs> to, to to go in that direction a little bit like there i was in preparation for this call i'm using my mobile connection to uh talk and i was trying to figure out whether the speed is right and the twitter was not loading mm -hmm. and i thought my internet connection is bad uh and then i remember it there's this thing with twitter they're slowing twitter down uh hmm. So the, there are various things, little and big, that they're doing to get the thing under control more. Hmm. Um. So, uh, well, let's let's talk a little about America and how it's viewed, or how the West is viewed. Um. You know, Biden is well. He's he's choosing to pay some attention to these issues. You know, uh, I mean, at least he's talking about, uh, well, let me ask. I, actually, I'm wondering if he has come to think of it. He, It's come to think of it. He may be emphasizing human rights issues more with China than with Russia, uh, because I guess the lead talking points with Russia are more about Ukraine and Crimea. I mean, well, you tell me, what is your perception? Does it seem to you, uh, you know, as uh, that 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 uh, the Biden administration is, uh, what's your perception of what they're saying about Russia to the extent that you're paying attention? I know you're not like a super political person. You're not like a political journalist. But do you have a sense for what kind of mindset the Biden administration is carrying into this summit, uh, you know, as they have expressed it, at least? I don't really know. I, I also don't have a good... Like, people have different, let's call them worldviews, like ideas of how the world works, how politics works, whether summits matter, uh, whether things that the president says matter, or it's for show. I don't have a, a clear view like that of my own um with biden uh like in terms of how russians i i, I tried to before uh we started to and tried to ask a few people what do you think of biden or what do you think russians think about biden and the response is like biden why would i think about biden and <laughs> and, and and that was my intuition is is how people feel about him personally i, I mean we don't pay as much attention to American politics generally. When there's somebody like Trump, well, it's easy to have an opinion on him because he is, as Putin called him, a colorful character, right? Uh, with like Obama, he was the first black president. So you have, there's something to grab onto and, and have some kind of a feeling right. or opinion or something. Uh, with Biden, he's an old white guy. He's been in politics for his entire life. And there's not you know he's not doing anything crazy he's not saying anything outrageous with these things about uh you know the rhetoric whether he's emphasizing human rights or this or that it's i've read somewhere it, i forget what the issue was in the belarus or something uh some american official said that something is unacceptable and uh, a comment I saw online is like, yeah, but what about the grief concern or great concern? Did they express the concern? Because that's what you hear. You know, something happens and then some uh, official says, we're very concerned about the situation here. What does that matter? What what does it mean? Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I think people kind of feel about it this way. If Biden, you know, Putin, Biden talk and Biden says, this is completely unacceptable what, what you're doing with Navalny and Putin goes, we're not doing anything. Okay. So there's that. Uh, in Was, terms uh, of, did Trump in have, terms of actual, yeah, 
in terms of actual like attempts to influence the situation, change the situation, uh, it's you know sanctions is one thing. Uh, the kinds of section, sanctions that we've seen are you know as I said, I can buy good cheese. That doesn't really doesn't seem that it would affect the regime very much. Uh, the average Russian would probably not be happy with their supply of cheese being diminished, <laughs> but it's so, not. So the sanctions don't don't have overwhelming rush support among the yeah. Russian people, so far as you can tell. Yeah. Um. The uh, how was Trump? How was Trump viewed? Did he have much of a of a of a fan base in Russia? I mean, I've you know, of some. course, in in America, he was viewed by some of his opponents as like a Russian tool, right? Like, you know, as you know, he there was this yeah. whole Russia Gate thing that didn't seem to pan out when it, you know, in the course of the actual Mueller investigation, as thoroughly as uh, Trump's opponents would have liked. But um, what, what what is there a a Russian view of uh, Trump? I haven't seen many people who bought into the Russian tool scenario. Uh, yeah. There were some, I think it was my mother who said we were like in a car and uh, they were talking about this on the radio. Uh, and she says, so weird, like a couple of years ago where a regional power can do anything and now we're just like assigning who the president of America is going to be. Uh, that, that, that leap seems... <laughs> Uh, just weird, and it's hard to to believe in that. Um, so among Russians, I haven't seen a lot of people who actually believe that Russia put Trump in power or uh, controlled him. Uh, I've seen some people who liked him. I think those mostly were the kinds of people who follow American politics as a hobby. You know, it's that also is is a weird kind of conversation when somebody's like really concerned with the social justice warrior warriors and the the American left has lost its mind and there is nothing of that sort. You mean there are Russians? There are Russians who say there are Russians who go around saying that. Every once in a while, you see that kind of person. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. there is there is even there was this comic, this like uh, panel comic online that showed. It's like a patient in therapy, and the patient keeps talking about the SJWs and, you know, just like the, the whole uh, list of, like, the American rights frustration with the American left. And then the therapist takes a bullhorn and says, you live in Barnaul. There's no, there are no social justice warriors around you. This is not your reality at all. Uh, why are you so concerned about this? And so... Uh, that kind of analysis or or pe the, the the people that i've seen uh, interacted with who had an opinion on trump of that sort tended to be people who again follow american politics as a hobby uh it's something to talk about um in terms of You know the situation in Russia and whether Russia is in a bad position is is Trump harming more than uh, helping? From what I've seen, it's less Trump, or in today, you know, Biden. It's more like America or the West. And the prevalent, I think, the prevalent position is the West does not like us, and that's you know, it's been driven home. For years now, we are, as I said, in the circle of enemies. Uh, they don't want, want what's best for us, and they're trying. You know, they're building the NATO bases around the country. The revolution in Ukraine was an American plot. Um, Belarus, the, the official government position is the Belarus is the, kind of, the same kind of situation. That those protests were organized from abroad, and Belarus is the last. You know, four post. If that goes down, then the next place in Ru is Russia. It's this kind of thing. It's not tied to an individual like Trump or Biden. It's uh, these like historical forces. This is what the West is always trying to do with Russia. So, so it sounds like Putin. I mean, this is this is the way Putin wants it to be seen, right? That yeah. the sanctions and everything else reflect 
American hostility, not just toward him, but toward Russian and the Russian yeah. people. And it sounds like he's having some success in selling that narrative. Yeah, or Russian sovereignty. You know, they want us to do what they say we should do. They don't want us to choose our fate ourselves. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, is there a way of, and it's like you think most Russians are, and this just may be a question you can't answer, but is your sense that most, most Russians interpret America's behavior that way? It's, it's anti Russian? I think so. And again, I think it's more of a mood than a position on a particular set of events or anything. It's mm -hmm. it, that, that I think is the thing that the TV propaganda accomplishes, uh, the most effectively. You just hear, you don't need to know a particular story. You just hear again something evil coming from the West. Again, there's, uh, you know, they're blaming us for this or that. Even this Navalny situation when, uh, you know, there are people on the West saying, you poisoned this guy. And it's like, well, again, we poisoned this person. We put Trump into office. We're doing the hacker attacks. We're doing everything that's evil in the world. Uh, and it just creates this mood of, uh, you know, being on the defensive and uh, not liking whoever is accusing you of anything. Uh-huh. Um, hmm. Is it even among your uh, kind of demographic, is this view somewhat widespread? I mean, I would think that Putin would have an easy time selling this narrative to like these people, these older people who watch TV yeah, and depend yeah. on state media. But is is there a sense, like among people you know, younger people, whatever, that, yeah, the West is kind of hard on Russia per se, as opposed to just being hard on Putin? So among the crowd you're talking about, I think, again, the West is sort of de-emphasized and like people are really concerned with what's happening within the country, this tightening. Uh, people are looking mm -hmm. for ways to leave, which is hard in a pandemic. Uh, it's so, you know, there is less and less of people of, you know, younger people, people who are on the internet, etc. With these kinds of things, like what's happening with Navalny, these laws against foreign agents and, and, and so forth is becoming more and more in your face. Uh, and mm -hmm. so it's harder to not care or not see the situation as getting a little, you know, concerning. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's much, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what the West does, what America does. It's, uh, this seems primarily a situation, you know, the people in power want to remain in power and uh, the the issue, the tension is with them rather than with foreign powers, I think. And, and, and when you when you talk about people wanting to leave. Uh, is that more about the freedom of expression or about the economic situation, which is partly a, a product of the sanctions, apparently, or what? Uh, it's the political thing. Again, lately, like in the past year, has become more uh, concerning. And it's not so much that, I think, it's not so much that a given individual is concerned about their, like the, People I'm thinking about when I'm talking about this are like people I've met, not journalists, not, you know, they, they don't have a platform there. They don't really have a reason to think that uh, the police will come after them, but maybe they will because the circle of people after whom the police now comes every once in a while is just expanding further. And if you look at that trend, that's been fairly consistent. Um, it, it's, it's not leading anywhere good. And so, uh, you know, people are thinking this is, it's also just a general feeling. I mean, sort of like, like when Trump was the president and a lot of people were frustrated with him for being quote unquote racist or this or that. It, it's not necessarily that they're concerned about, you know, their safety or job or this mm -hmm. or that. It's just 
this place is starting to get more difficult to have a good mood on a given day in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, is there anything else you would, you would want to say? Uh, I, I, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know what other questions to ask you, you know, kind of about the, the summit, and and I don't really want to confine our our discussion to that anyway. But are there any other um, are there any other things you would say by way of uh, helping people understand perspectives within Russia? Um, I can share a recent realization. I guess is the word, uh, or or a, a growing understanding of my own of the situation in Russia. Uh, is that so I live now I'm renting a house outside of St. Petersburg uh you know kind of a rural mm -hmm. area and I would like to at some point own a house somewhere um and so talking to people like in the place where I am walking around other places uh you know hearing a conversation that my mother had with a Tajik worker who does kind of gardening and, and stuff uh, around where she has a dacha. Through these kinds of like very direct, personal uh, kind of conversations, I'm starting to realize, oh, no, there is really a ruling class that people call Siliviki, you know, the police, the FSB, etc., etc. And and the way you understand that is you realize these are these, these are these people's houses. Like when I walk through uh like a you know a, a settlement outside of St. Petersburg and you see the bigger houses the chances are that's somebody from the police and hmm. that made me see the situation i don't know it's it's a it's a more direct way of relating to this like analysis of the forces that operate within the country it's not that there's like some shadowy group that you don't know who these people are or uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, some kind of Marxist economic analysis of like, here's one class, here's another class. No, just walk down the street and like with the place where I live, we have, there's this like road that goes along uh, a lake and to the left go uh, the little streets and they're just numbered. Street number one, number two, number three, and some of them have names and the 20th is called the Ch the Czechists Street. Czechist is from Cheka, the old Soviet, you know, predecessor of the KGB and all these structures. So it's the street mm. is named the Cheka Street because these are the people who own the land there. And, and the, the higher the fence, the bigger the house, the higher the chance that this person is from that kind of organization. Most recently, the most recent and the, the reason I started thinking about it lately is I was just taking a walk around where I live, like uh, uh, half an hour away from where I live, just a random uh, neighborhood. And I was mm -hmm. with a dog and uh, a guy, it's a, a different dog came up to mine and then the owner showed up and I talked for, with the owner for 10 minutes and ask him what the settlement is, you know, how expensive are the houses and whatnot. And he just, <laughs> he had this expression on his face, like he doesn't have anybody to talk to. And he's kind of lost. He's like, it's all cops. It's all cops. I bought a house here when there was nothing here 10 years ago. It was just like a dirt road and nothing. And it was cheap. And now it's not cheap anymore. And you see these big houses and I'm surrounded by cops. I wonder if that reflects, I mean, I wonder if they're steering more and more resources toward cops by way of, like, consolidating their loyalty to the regime. I, think I mean, so, were cops yeah. always rich? Yeah. Well, I huh. mean, not every cop, like, you're, uh, you know. A right, cop this isn't the average the cop, not... I realize, but, right, but. But, yeah, there are more like, resources relatively... are being yeah are being uh, tar uh moved towards uh we call them the silavi vedamstvo would you like the you know the police the army the fsb um 
like the riot police, there have been at least instances of when a policeman was given an apartment by the state after he got into an altercation at a protest. So that's a mm. very clear, uh, you know, attempt to give a sign to these people. We're with you. The state uh, is siding with the people who protect the power of the people that are currently in power, right? You don't want, you know, when the, the protest movement, the like the most, uh, the, the the recent kind of leg of the protest movement start was starting in, in 2011, there was a period of, I don't know, half a year, a year, when people would try to chant, the police is with the people, right? So it's like a, a crowd of protesters are walking down some street and there's a, a line of police uh, ostensibly to keep order. And people would really try mm -hmm. to, you know, get that chant going so that the police does not feel like we are against you. And we're not against you. We're against, you know, Putin or this or that. That didn't last very long because the police did not really respond to that with like, oh, yeah, we are with the people. Uh, when clashes were happening, uh, there was some violence. Uh, the state was very supportive of the police and not so much of the protesters. And they've been trying to maintain that. Mm. Well, it doesn't sound encouraging. Um, and, you know, it's one of those situations where, I mean, you're always in situations like this kind of say, well, maybe the people will rise up, but it's kind of hard to imagine that working out well in the short term. You know what I mean? I mean, they're, well, they're very... Also, I mean, uh, the, the Belarus situation was, uh, what right. would to be the word, frustrating to, to observe because the people did raise up. Like the numbers of people uh, in the streets were unprecedented. Just, uh, again, as that was happening i couldn't really see i just it was hard to imagine how do you just move on from that uh as mm -hmm. as you know the president and turns out you just move on if you have the police on your side you just move on and on the side of the yeah. people you know what i mean it's it's a million dollar question like what do you do how do you organize or what do you what does rising up mean in practical terms yeah that's what I mean. I, I, just trying to play out the thought experiment, like, how does it work out well? Um, I mean, in the long run, you can imagine it working out well. It's just that, uh, it, it, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, don't I, know. I really wonder what um, 2024 is going to be like, because 2024, you guys are having an election. Russia is having an election. Ukraine is having an election. Belarus, I think it's some vague uh, statement that I saw uh, that they're supposed to have an election no later than 2025. It's like between now and 2025. So there's a, a lot can be crammed into that one year. And and these things are connected, right? What happens in one country influences what happens in another country. And you can, if you, if you let your imagination run wild, you can imagine... You know, the democratic movement in Belarus getting somehow connected to the democratic movement in Russia. If there are huge protests in Belarus happening, saying we're not going to take one more term from Lukashenko, and then the same kind of thing starts happening in Russia, you know, I don't know what exactly the dynamic of such a situation would be, but it, these points of tension matter, right? It's... uh you can be very much against Lukashenko a year before the election, and there's not much is happening. And then, even though you don't have any illusions about the upcoming election, when there's a thing happening like that, people did go to the polls, and then they say, you know, Lukashenko has 80% or something. That's a point of tension that can get people out in the street. But then, if, you know, it, it, it's still a it's still a question what I, whether that's going to accomplish anything, getting out in the street. Well, can you imagine anything like that happening in Russia? In, sure. I mean, uh, in, in 2024? Sure. It, it, imagine in, in response to what? Part. So the election results co come out and people say, no, this is, we don't trust these, and they 
protest them and claim that the election was rigged or what? Yeah, I mean, that has been happening. Protests after, you know, Putin's inauguration last time, it, they were not huge. Um, the question mm -hmm. is how many of different kinds of points of tension and, uh, you know, reasons for people to, as you say, rise up would come before that. What other components are going to be there? What the economic situation is going to be there? Because, you know, some people would sit at home if, you know, they at least have a job, but maybe not so yeah. much if they don't have a job. Navalny is supposed to get out before then, uh, but then, of course, you can you can come up with more reasons for him to stay behind bars. Well, is 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 are, are the judicial proceedings over? I mean, he's gotten whatever sentence he's going to get, and and that's done supposedly. Right, but you can always open a new case for something else. I think they right. actually when have opened some other about how he stole all of the his supporters' money. So I mean mm. that's not going to be hard for the for the system if they decide to go that route. It's not going to be hard to just do another procedure and, and uh, prolong the sentence for another reason. And right now he's the only game in town aside from Putin. He is. There's no. There's nobody else to to who's obviously on the horizon who who yeah, could not really, uh, do not what really. he's done. Yeah. I mean, he's incredibly creative, for one thing. I mean, even, you know, even if there were some kind of conventional opposition figure, they wouldn't they wouldn't think to do the stuff he's done. He's also very courageous, um, like the the kinds of that was oh, the yeah. thing that the, the change of opinion that I did notice after his return to Russia is like before that. You know, do you support Navalny? Do you not support Navalny? I kind of don't like him, whatever, but uh, a point of agreement that I've seen in just broadly is whatever you think about him, he does have big balls. After after spending some time in a coma, just go back while everybody's telling him you really should not go back. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, he's he's all in. No, he's a man with a mission. Um, Okay, you well, this has been uh, interesting. Now, if people are wondering what they can do to... Uh, to alleviate your plight, I think one thing they could do is subscribe to your newsletter. Do you want to talk a little about your newsletter? I'm sure. It's called psychopolitica.com. I don't know if that's going to alleviate my <laughs> my plight. You're suffering? <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, well, I have this thing. Uh, hmm? Okay, so P-S-Y-C-H-O-P-O-L-I-T-I-K-A. Did I do that right? Politica? The C-A at the is that end. Right? Psycho Politica. It's not a K. It's not the Russian. It, it, so it's not the Russian. Okay, I imagined that. Um, okay, so uh, Politica with a C, and it's like it's too weird for me to try to describe. I leave this to you. <laughs> what is this newsletter? I don't. I don't have a good description myself. I write and I draw, and I publish some conversation, like transcripts from conversations that I have here uh, on YouTube. Uh, I can say about the last kind of big issue that I put out, it was a collaboration of, between me and two other artists, one from the US, one from Greece. And that thing started out with, in one of the exposés, one of the more recent exposés of Navalny's team, after he's already in jail, they did this video about Putin's residence in the Valdai region in Russia. And one thing they noticed there is he has a float tank, uh, the sensory deprivation. Oh, really, like chamber. a like a a, re a relaxation, a sensory deprivation tank, or, mm -hmm. or yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, and they they presented at this as like the whole shtick there was the propaganda tries to make Putin out to be some ascetic person who doesn't care about the riches and he just cares about Russia and then look at the shit that he has. Does that seem like an ascetic lifestyle to you? He even has this weird thing about, you know, what a flotation tank is, is a, a little capsule where you float on water that's so salty that it just carries you. It's heated up to body temperature. Mm -hmm. There's no light and no sound. So, uh, you're after what happens to most people is after a little bit you 
stop noticing the contours of your body. You just become this formless awareness. And so I grabbed mm -hmm. onto this little detail of Putin owning a float tank, and we made this comic about, uh, you know, this thing with Putin owning a float tank, a history of a float tank. It was invented by John C. Lilly, who's like a real-life mad scientist. See, by the end of his life, he was talking to aliens um it was not well, he was a big LS, he was a big lsd guy too right see the combination of the flow tank lsd and ketamine was what led him <laughs> where it led him and cat they, they people usually point to ketamine as like the wrong turn <laughs> like this is this is where shit got <laughs> complicated and so we have you know there well, are all know, these I... different elements and one other story there is navalny's post that he put out on Instagram. Uh, he was not... I always forget the difference between jail and prison, but he was like in a preliminary detention center before he got uh, transported. And he wrote this very poetic... I really like this post uh, of his... Uh, this poetic vignette about... He's describing his situation. I'm in a small room. There's a desk, a chair, kettle. My... Uh, the the plate and the fork and you know it's all from shining metal and uh i only get communication from this intercom on the wall a voice says my number and get ready for sanitary treatment etc and so he's describing this jail situation but he describes it as clearly this is not a jail this is a space uh spaceship i'm on a journey through space and i love uh sci-fi movies and books and so I couldn't say so he's, he's building this metaphor of what he's going through being a journey to a beautiful new world. And yes, space travel is dangerous. You can be hit by an asteroid and maybe you made a navigation error and you're not going to arrive where you were planning to arrive or it's going to take a long time. But could I um, refuse such a trip? Of course I couldn't. Uh, you know, there are good. So he's, he's building this thing. So I weave this into this, you know, here's what John Lilly thought about aliens and computers and AI. And here's Putin on in a float tank. And here's Navalny thinking he's on a spaceship. And uh, we made this weird mosaic of um, stuff, just a, a way to see the world. It's all facts. Everything in that thing, like the text is just listing facts. but it's so bizarre. The mosaic that uh, you end up with is so bizarre that, uh, I don't know, it leaves you wondering. So people should check out Psychopolitica. It's on Substack. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if like Putin, like the charitable interpretation of his having the sensory deprivation tank would be that he's on a spiritual journey. <laughs> Maybe he he's could. seeking be... ego death. You think he's... he's seeking ego death? That would be a story. The thing that I think Putin, Putin did... Putin seeks ego death. That maybe he is already there. Uh, the thing that Putin did <laughs> I don't well, think I so. think... <laughs> the, the thing that I think Putin did well uh, is to maintain his image a very kind of fluid one. Like, we don't know much about his personal life. We don't, you know, there's not a lot of, mm -hmm. like, these particulars of what he actually is like as a person. And so you can project all kinds of things onto that image and, you know, the audience can project and then he or his team can cast him in different situations. And so I think he's like as a character, as a, an image you can work with, uh, there's a lot you can play with. And I can imagine him like he says things sometimes like talking about how hard it is to be a president he says you know you really turn into a function you're just you do what what needs to be done and you're not thinking about yourself and it's just you know hmm. uh, i agree very much looking forward to retirement and actually doing the things that i would like to do with my spare time but for now i'm just have to do what the situation calls for right or yeah, but he's gonna have to be go ahead I just remembered another thing. There is this something I love about the Russian, I call it political mythology, just like kinds of ideas that are out there is the idea that Putin does not even exist. 
There is like versions of it. Maybe he's a team of lookalikes, or maybe it's one double that replaced the original Putin, or maybe he's an android or a few androids, you know, different variations, uh, 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 an illusion, just like some kind of schizophrenic thing happening with a society. And there was this one interview where the interviewer typed in something like, is it true that Putin into Google and showed him the list of suggested results from either Google or Yandex, uh, which is the Russian Google. And one of them was, is it true that Putin is a double or something like that? And he asked Putin, you know, point blank, so are you a double? And Putin like smirking said, nope. And he goes, mm -hmm. well, were there ever doubles? And he goes, nope. Were, did you ever consider having a double? I did. And it's just like, he's he's doing these like very sparse remarks. He Eventually yeah. he said that uh, during the the war on terror uh, here in Russia, the, the connected with the, che to the Chechen wars, uh, he said, yeah, it was dangerous. And so the idea was floated to have a double so that he would appear at gatherings or go there. So if, you know, an attack is launched on me, it wouldn't uh, strike me, but we didn't decide to do that. And of course, that's what a double that replaced the original president of Russia would say, that I'm not a double, and uh, <laughs> the idea was just floated. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's a double. I uh, I, I see I see unifying theme. I, I, I see I see <laughs> essence of uh, Putin. I just, you know, I just think he's a, guy, a shirtless guy on a horseback, man. Um, that, that was a period. But I do think somebody suggests to him that, she, yeah, did, has he gotten to the age where he realizes it's no longer in his interest to be photographed uh, shirtless on a on on horseback? I yeah, haven't like seen those, him shirtless. Those pictures are all a few years old. Oh yeah, yeah. that that the particular all picture right. you're talking about, yeah, it's pretty old. I haven't seen him shirtless yeah. lately. He still does. You know what? Yeah. The Russian state, I think, is doing. I don't know if it's well, but it's it's you know, something that, that is worth the, of paying attention to in terms of this, like, uh, constructing of images, um, uh, is lately you've been seeing a trend for a formation of like a, a set of like a visual part of an ideology, I suppose. And the ideology is some kind of a weird mixture of world, world, world war two, cult i will say uh and and the uh, christian orthodoxy and they merge in them in these weird they, there is a new mm. temple that they built in moscow uh that's like the temple of the army or something it's it, or, or the police or something yeah. and it's it's a kind of temple that we didn't see before it's you know it's a it, it it has to get now into the history books i think if you're looking at like what the russian orthodox church is and has been and uh what its traje trajectory is now there's this thing there there's a military temple that looks like from uh like a comic book universe or something and they've been doing things like that uh like monuments mm. uh a museum of the army uh traditions you know that there's this thing that they've launched a few years ago called the uh, I'm gonna butcher it. I'm not sure about the English uh, translation. It's like immortal, not platoon, but like immortal, whatever, some regiment of the army. And the idea Brigade is that people, it's like a march that people go on carrying photos of the people that their family has lost in the war, mm. which is in Russia, mm. you know, the Soviet Union lost. I, the yeah. estimates are some like 20 to 30 million people. I mean, the, even just the fact that you have 10 million that are kind of maybe, it's a, a huge number of, of losses. And so every family has something uh, to connect to that to that tragedy. And so they're, you know, using this as a, a way to create these customs and imagery and buildings and traditions uh, the military parade and all that to create this like yeah. vision of what Russia is or is going to be. And they're 
I think are doing a good job at that. I think that's actually something that Navalny lacks. He has a program. He has, you know, uh, we want uh, the right. three branches of the government to stay separate and we want honest elections and free speech and all that. But there's not something like emotional, emotionally charged, like here's the Russia that we're going to build. Yeah. The uh, yeah. I mean, one thing Trump and and, and uh, Putin actually do have in common is they're both they're both ethno nationalists and they're both uh, very much want to draw on kind of draw on and restore kind of traditional national mythology and and um, you can see why why they would like each other and that that's not the only thing they have in common by any means. Um, so Nikita, we should get back to work. Mm -hmm. Uh, not that this wasn't, uh, not that you didn't, you didn't, you didn't put some real, uh, some real effort into this. This has been a great conversation. Um, but people should subscribe to your newsletter, Psychopolitica. And what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's Nikita S. Petrov. That's just my name. P-E-T-R-O-V. That's just one word or there, what's that? One word. Yeah. Nikita S. P-E-T-R-O-V. Okay. Well, thank you. This has been very illuminating. And now thank we you. will get back to talking in our other capacity. Thanks. All right.